Okay, so today looking at a new class of first order ODEs. They're actually not new. We've done a bunch of these kind of informally, but we want to firm up this idea. And so a type of differential equation that we can have are called separable. What makes them separable is that you can write them in a product of functions of t and functions of y or u. Um, and that word product is really key. So first order ODE that can be written in the form, you know, y prime equals g of t times h of y, or u prime equals g of t times h of u. Sometimes we'll use u instead of y in this course for the unknown function, same thing. Uh, we call it separable. So another way to think about this is if u prime, which we know is a function of t and u, can be written as a product g of t times h of u. So let's look at a few simple examples to see how this looks. Um, so u prime of t equals sine of t times u squared. All right, you may or may not see this t, but we know it's a function of t. So can this be written as a product of the two? Well, yes, because we see that, you know, this here, this is a function of t. And this here is some g of u. And in the definition, we use g and h. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's some g of t times h of u. And so, yes, this is separable. Um, what makes that nice is that they're much easier to solve, um, typically. As long as we can find an antiderivative, um, there's an easy way to go about these. So, yes, this is separable because you can write it as a product of a function of t and a function of u. For this second one, um, v prime of t equals sine of v of t. Well, it, can we write this as a function of v? Well, this is a function of v. And then a function of uh, t, well, we could say that our function of t over here, let's call it h of t, is just 1. All right, so we have a function of v and we have a function of t as 1. Yes, this is separable as well. Okay, and then the last example down here, y prime equals y plus t. So this is not separable, even though it looks pretty simple. Um, I cannot separate the variables um, in the in the usual way. So this is what we call not separable. Okay, so this is not uh, workable in that traditional sense. So let's work through an example here. Um, we're going to do a, an application problem, but first of all. You know, the question that comes up is how will I know that an uh, equation is separable or not? Typically, it's pretty apparent, like something like this, that it is separable um, or that it's not, because it's really just is it a product of these two functions that are completely independent of each other, or is it, is it a sum of the two things? Can I not split it in this exact way? Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at a uh, falling object example. We'll set up our model and, and show that it's a separable equation, then table it, talk about a general way to solve it, then come back and actually solve it. Okay, so falling object. So let's talk about like the net force on some mass m that's falling out of the sky, okay, straight down just under the influence of gravity and it's close to the Earth's surface. So what we're gonna do is say it has a positive downward velocity. So even though uh, velocity is a vector, here we're gonna consider it a scalar, and we're gonna say that mo its velocity in the downward direction is actually the positive direction, okay? So we're talking about its falling speed. Um, so we know that the you know force due to gravity is mass times a gravitational constant. We know this has units of acceleration here. The other part is that it's going to have some resistive force to it. Um, and for a spherical object, and we can come up with where this comes from later, but let's say that we have a workable model, which is there's some 
constant of proportionality k, which is positive. But here it's working against the downward velocity, so we're going to give it a negative sign. And it's proportional to the square of that downward velocity. All right, so this is only going to work when we claim that the downward direction is the positive direction. But the net force on this mass m then is F equals force due to gravity plus the resistive force. So that looks like mg minus kv squared of t. And we're assuming velocity is a function of, of time as well. So this is equal to the force. But what do we know about the force? Well, we know from um, Newton's law that this is equal to m times a. Right, mass times acceleration. Well, what's acceleration? But it's the change in the velocity. All right, so I have mv prime is equal to mg minus kv squared t. And then what I can go ahead and do is divide everything by m. So I'll get g minus k over mv squared of t. Okay, so this is the model for a falling mass um, just under the force of gravity, and it has some resistive forces coming down. Um, and this is, in fact, separable. And so you might pause for a second and think about the examples we just looked at and say, and you can literally pause the video, and say, how is this separable? Also, we've unpaused. And, well, what we can do is see this here we can call this a function of v, right? So we'll call this some g of v, and then it's all being multiplied by one, some h of t, okay? So my two variables, v and time, can be split separately. So this is separable. So that's good. That means we can take the method we're about to learn and then reapply it. So I'm gonna give you a uh, general kind of way to solve these things right now. Okay, so the uh, falling object example is separable, but it's got some algebraic stuff that's gonna muddy up the concept. So we're gonna to go to a slightly simpler example to illustrate how this process works. So let's say we're given this ODE, u prime equals t u squared, an initial condition of u of 1 equals 4. So this is clearly separable because I have a function of t and a function of u. So, you know, we can write this with, um, we can write this with g of t equals t, h of u equals u squared. So there we are. And so how we'd go about solving this is then dividing over um, the u squared term to the left to separate the variables. Okay, so we'll have u prime of t over u squared t equals t on the other side. So the idea would be that we would integrate both sides um, with respect to t, and then we'll be able to um, find out what u is. They're both not that bad, so if we go ahead and integrate then u prime of t over u squared t dt. We'll get some c1 and integral t dt plus c2. Um, and then you say, well, you know, how do, we, how do we do this when we don't know what, you know, u is? Um, so we make a substitution, right? Um, and we say, well, let w be uh, u prime of t. No, sorry. No, we're letting w be u of t. So then we have dw is u prime of t dt. All right, and then we have a nicer integral to play with up here. We don't really need to know what u is. So we'll say, all right, we make the substitution, and now we've got dw over w squared. t dt plus c2, and then we carry this out. So what do we get on the left? Well, we get negative 1 over w plus, uh, well, we can deal with the c's now. 
one half t squared plus c, and we know c is really c2 minus c1. And then we can, um, from there, resubstitute, right? So this is really this, and from here, this is an algebra problem, right? This is no longer calculus, you're solving for u. So how do we do that? Well, we can uh, invert both sides, right? Take the reciprocal and negate both sides to get then u of t is negative 1 over 1 half t squared plus c. And if you wanted to, you know, take it a step further, you could factor out the 1 half on the bottom and bring it to the top and say, you know, this is negative 2 over t squared plus 2c. But let's say this is our, uh, our general solution. And we are looking for the solution to the IVP where we had u of 1 is 4. So we know u of 1 needs to be equal to 4, which is negative 1 over 1 half times 1 squared plus c. So then we'll go ahead and solve here. So 4 um, times, I'll just cross multiply here, 4 times 1 half plus c equals negative 1. So 2 plus 4c equals negative 1. So c equals what? c equals negative 3 fourths. All right. So now we have the solution to our IVP, which is u of t is negative 1 over t squared over 2 minus 3 over 4. Okay, so by being able to rewrite this as two separate functions on the left and on the right, making the substitution, we're able to, you know, um, ultimately find the function u. What this hinges upon is the ability to integrate it, right? So something can be separable, but then you might not be able to find the integral itself. So, you know, a lot of these examples will be solvable, but just to know that that is a possibility. Okay. So a quick note um, on very common alternate notation used for this. Um, and you've probably seen me use this kind of on the fly in class. But uh, it goes like this. Essentially, use Leibniz notation instead. And we kind of suppress the argument t in the equation. Um, and you treat the infinitesimals or the differentials as tiny quantities that you can move around. It is backed up. Um, it is it it does work. However, mathematically, it is um, disagreed upon. <laughs> so you know, there's a lot of purists out there that would take issue with this, but they're not here. So we're gonna do it. Um, so here we go. So we'll start with the same equation, but we'll look at Leibniz notation instead. And again, we're going to suppress that u of t and just consider them to be variables. Um, so we can separate this like we did before. We know this is, you know, some, let's, let's not switch up these the whole time. So g of t times h of u. Okay, so it is separable. And now what we can do is bring all the u, um, variables to the left side and all the t variables to the right side. So we divide both sides by u squared and we multiply both sides by dt and we end up with something looking remarkably similar to before. So that substitution is kind of unnecessary um, and, and, and this just plays out in exactly the same way. So, you know, we'll integrate both sides. some plus c1 and plus c2. And again, we're at uh, an algebra problem, and it has the same solution. Okay, but this is a way to use Leibniz notation to think about these quantities a little bit more simply. Um, you end up at the same place. So I encourage you to do it. Um, 
it's also you know uh, there's a there's a lesson here that sometimes not using Leibniz notation hides what's going on. I'm just thinking about u prime of t. Are you really thinking of it as a rate, and how can that help you solve a problem, especially when it comes to units, dimensional analysis, and things like that? So this is a good one to stock away and to uh, you know, and to employ in these practice sets. Okay, so let's walk through um, a general procedure for these. Um, types of equations. So if you can write it as some function of t times some function of u, first what we'll do is separate it. Okay, so you'll have your uh, du over h of u over here, and your g of t dt over here. Next you will integrate. Again, this assumes that you can. So du over h of u, you'll get some constant. Antiderivative of g, you'll get some constant. And then from there, um, we take a look at, you know, we'll call q of u the antiderivative of this side. And we know that um, We'll say g of t is some big antiderivative here. And so then we see that this guy here can be written as g of g of u equals, or this should be q. Q of u equals g of t plus c, where c is c2 minus c1. Okay. So notice that all the derivatives had vanished, and now just solving for u is an algebra problem. Okay. All right, so just wanted to get that down here. So from here, you know, it's anybody's game. Um, you're gonna probably need to use several rules to uh, get there, but last step would be to then go ahead and solve. And, you know, whatever you have to do, um, carrying C along, And you'll produce a general solution, and it will typically look like something like this. So u of t is the inverse of q on g of t plus c. This notation may or may not be helpful, um, but this is this is how it works in general. Okay, so let's do uh, one quick example here using this process. So let's say solve u prime we have initial condition of u of zero equals zero and we'll use um, separation of variables here so let's hit pause and try to give this a whack with what we've looked at so far and then we'll come back and do it together Okay, so again, this is another one where we're going to treat the right-hand side. We're going to call this my, um, what, my h of u, and we'll call my g of t just equal to 1. So then I can rewrite this on the left as u prime. Actually, let's go ahead and separate. We'll call this du over here, u squared plus 1 on the bottom. I'll multiply the dt to the right-hand side. We'll get 1 dt on the right. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So from here, you know, we're going to need to integrate both sides. We'll get some c, which is, you know, c2 minus c1. And so, you know, how do we integrate um, u squared, 1 over u squared plus 1? Well, we don't have a u up top, 
So this is actually going to be a trig sub. So we can pull up our table. And again, this is a pretty common one, but a nice, uh, nice reference to have um, is the table of integrals when you're practicing. So this is one plus x squared. So your a is one. So this is an arctan. Okay, where the coefficient a is, or this uh, this first term is one. So not too bad. So shoot back here. So this is really arctan of u plus c equals t plus c. All right, and then how are we going to then go ahead and solve for u? Where are you going to invert, right, to solve um, for u itself using the antiderivative? So this antiderivative is arctan, so how do we undo arctan? Well, we take the tangent of both sides. So then u is going to be the tangent of t plus c. And we know we're taking this particular antiderivative where um, u of 0 equals 0. So we can plug in 0 here on the right. So for initial condition, equals tangent of 0 plus c. And so tangent of c equals 0. When is that the case? Well, we could take the case when c equals 0. But it really could be any multiple of what 0 plus pi. So any um, integer value of pi. Right. But we can say c equals 0 or k pi. All right. So we can write that all up. U of t is tan, just tan t. Okay, accidentally uh, cropped it there, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So uh, just to backtrack one bit here, at this stage, uh, when you are looking for an initial value problem solution, and you want to plug in your initial condition, this made sense to do this here, but you can also do it at this step. And sometimes it's actually easier. So let's write easier sometimes to plug it in right after you find the antiderivatives to go ahead and enforce that. Especially with, well, there's just a lot of different ways it can show up. So think about right after you get your antiderivative to go ahead and find what that constant should be for your initial value problem. All right. So let's go back to the um, ODE with the falling object and see what we can do. Okay, so let's head back to our original equation, which again is separable. Um, but because of its form, it's going to be a bit of a long walk to solve this. But I think it's cool. It will highlight some interesting um, uh, like underpinnings along the way, stuff we need to consider when we're solving other problems. So it's worth it. Um, but just know this is going to be a bit of a walk, and I'm going to leave one big integral for you to do um, so that this doesn't take absolutely forever, okay, and use a table to get there. So, right, this is separable if we say that, you know, this is my function of v and 1 is my function of t. So I'm going to separate it by bringing this all over here. So we'll do it like so. And I'm going to negate it as well. So I'm going to, you know, just to keep things easier here. So you see how this is negative over here. That means I'm going to factor out a negative 1 on the right and then make this negative dt over here. Okay. So signs change. This thing's over here. Now this integral is what I'm going to have you verify for yourself. Um, or you can trust me, but obviously it's good practice to uh, carry this out. So what this ends up being. Um, on the left hand side is this big ugly thing. Okay, so it ends up being one half square root of m over g times k times the ln of the absolute value of v minus the square root of mg over k all over v plus square root of mg over k. And this is plus C2. Okay. So or let's call this C1. 
So this is the uh, left-hand side here. This all obviously equals uh, negative t plus c2 on the right. And then we can gather these constants. Obviously, this is um, pretty daunting. So one way to simplify here is to take this um, this nasty thing that we know is the square root of m over mg over k. Oh, hold. Thought I had an error here. I should just trust myself. So um, what we want to do is actually go ahead and call this. Let's mark it in red. Call alpha this thing here, mg over k under the radical. Um, what this will do will be allow me to simplify this, this, and this. Um, obviously, we're going to have to factor out a radical g, but that's no issue. So writing this a little bit simpler is then going to be 1 half times um, alpha over 2g. So, so this will be just 1 half. We'll do alpha over g for now, and then we'll simplify that. So then times ln of v minus alpha over v plus alpha. This will just make the algebra that much nicer. We'll call this c3. All right, and I am just going to neaten this up to be alpha over 2g. So from here, um, we know c3 is an arbitrary constant. Next, we're going to solve for v, and this is just um, an algebra problem. It's not too, too terrible. So we're going to multiply both sides by this. And what we will get is, you know, 2g over, uh, or multiply both sides by 2g over alpha. And so this constant times this is still an arbitrary constant. Um, right, because uh, g and alpha are, are positive, so um, this just becomes a new constant. We don't have to distribute this in and get, you know, 2g over alpha times c3. We'll just call that c4, but this right-hand side, negative t times 2g over alpha, we do want that there. So, and then on the left, we're just left with the ln absolute value of v minus alpha over v plus alpha. Okay, so from here, how do we, you know, get access to v if it's trapped inside ln? We use what we used last time and raise both sides as powers of e. So we need to be a little bit careful here um, because what do we get? Well, we'll be left with v minus alpha over v plus alpha on this side. And then, um, well, keep the brackets on for now. And then we'll get, you know, e to the c4 times e to the minus 2g over alpha t. And you say, well, isn't this just a, you know, arbitrary constant? And the answer is actually no, this is, this is positive, right? So this um, e to the c4, if you're going to call it an arbitrary constant, it is arbitrary to a degree, but it is um, positive. So we'll, you know, we'll say e to the c4 equals c5, and we know that this is um, a positive value for c5 only. So it's something you need to keep track of, okay? Um, and this is why we give subscripts along the way, so we can go back, see what assumptions we made, and see if they break down. All right, so then we can rewrite this then as c5 e to the minus 2g over alpha t equals this thing over here. Obviously, we got to unlock the absolute values. So in doing that, it's going to give us a plus or minus on the right-hand side. And then, you know, now that we're talking about, okay, well, this can be positive or negative, and we were concerned about this being just strictly positive, this is now an arbitrary constant again. Okay, so we're going to call it C6, and I'm just going to jot that in here. All 
okay? Now going in and solving for V, again, an algebra problem. Um, so we just can jump right through. Um, you know, you multiply both sides by V plus alpha, isolate the variable, and what we're gonna end up with is the following. So mg over k times 1 plus c e to the negative 2t and then this is the um, this is the inverse of alpha right Let me double check my assumption here yeah so this becomes integral of or radical sorry kg over m all over 1 minus c e to the minus 2 t k g over m. And let's see here. So to get our initial condition, so this is the, in, in general, this is the general solution. Let's pause there for a second. So this is the form it's going to have, right? So let's do dot, dot, dot here to signify there's a bit of uh, solving you got to do, and then we resub out what alpha really means. Um, and then we can assert our initial condition, which we said was V of 0 equals 0, right? Starting with 0 velocity and then falling from there. So in doing that, what happens? Well, that means that this e to the zero, there's my pen here. That means this e will be to the zero, this e will be to the zero. And so we'll really get that v of zero equals this radical mg over k times one plus c over one minus c, since those e terms will become one and we need this to be equal to zero. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, um, first of all, C can't be one, um, but it tells us that C equals negative one gives us the desired solution. So then our specific solution to this is radical mg over k, one minus e, to the minus 2t, you sure that's minus, yes, kg over m, all over 1 plus e to the minus 2t, kg over m. And this is actually the definition of hyperbolic tangent. So what we actually see is this coefficient of radical mg over k times the hyperbolic tangent of t times radical kg over m. Okay, so you can look up that definition if you'd like, but that's hyperbolic tangent. So um, what we could do, which would be pretty fun right now as a little exercise, is to take, is to like put some numbers into this and, and, and make it work for us. So let's start with, you know, um, mass equals one kilogram. Keep it simple. Um, G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's do this K, this kind of resistance coefficient, um, which is supposed to be, you know, this, it's, this comes from like a spherical object. Um, this number so and the units are newtons per meter per second all right and then maybe plot this and see what happens um, and let's see if this you know makes any sense okay so let's take a look here over Desmos. 
Um, and what do we see? So when mass is 1, g is 9.8, and k was 0 0.004, um, what we get is this hyperbolic tangent function. So what do we see? A steep increase in the velocity until it reaches a certain point of 49.49. Uh, units here are going to be what? Meters per second. So does it make sense something would have a terminal velocity of 49.49 uh, meters per second? And it looks like it does, you know, um, level off there. So, I mean, a uh, reasonable terminal velocity, you know, baseball, I believe is around 95 to 100 miles an hour terminal velocity, whereas a, a skydiver is something in the vicinity of like 65 um, miles per hour. So for this thing, that's one kilogram. Maybe it's, you know, the resistive force is a little bit uh, stronger on this than other objects. So this is perfectly within the realm of reasonable. So kind of an interesting... Um, And I actually just realized I was thinking in miles per hour. This is in meters per second. So this is more like 100 miles per hour. Uh, we could go ahead and convert this thing if we wanted to. But 100 miles an hour, pretty reasonable in terms of a, a terminal velocity for one kilogrammed object. Again, that's pretty close to a, a baseball. So, um, so yeah, this makes some sense. Um, so with these coefficients, with these constants in place, this is a pretty good model, or so it would seem. We could, you know... Get a table of data, line it up, see how good this is, make adjustments. That's the real process of modeling. So um, what I want to do is do one more quick, just kind of purely algebraic example that highlights some good stuff, and then we'll call it a day. Okay. So for this one, we're going to solve the differential equation and determine the interval of validity. Um, again, a differential equation's solution needs to be a continuous function. So if there's breaks in it, that needs to be considered. We can only have it where um, the solution is connected to a given initial condition. So if there's a point of specific specificity that we have, um, we need the function to be on the interval where that one is live, where that one is active and that one works. There could, If it's broken up into several pieces, you can still have places where the solution works, but it won't be the same solution that's on one um, piece and then jumps to a continuous piece or a discontinuous piece. All right, so if you have an asymptote, you can only have a solution on one side of it or the other side of it. Okay, both intervals are valid, but only one will have be connected to the um, initial condition that you have. Right? Think about it on being at a certain point. There's only one way to draw a curve through that and where that curve will be continuous and be a solution. So I'll shut up now and we'll do, we'll do the uh, example and this will highlight what I'm talking about. So if I have dy dx is 6y squared x and I do have an initial condition of y of 1 is 1 25th. Okay, so back to y's and x's instead of using t's, that's fine. Um, so it should be clear that this is separable. So we go ahead and separate it. So I'm going to leave the 6 on the right and bring this dy over y squared equals 6x dx on the right-hand side. Okay. So from here, we've kind of already done something similar to this, where we get negative 1 over y equals, uh, what, 3x squared plus c. And so at this point, it's actually good to find the... Um, initial condition, um, or to find C that that verifies our initial condition or enforces it is another way to say it. So y of one equals one twenty fifth. So negative one over one twenty fifth equals three times one squared plus twenty five uh, plus C. And so what does this mean? Negative twenty five equals three plus C. So C must be negative 28. So then the solution we're interested in is, well, actually, we got to go back to our implicit one here. So negative 
1 over y equals 3x squared minus 28. So this is what I was talking about before about setting your initial condition, finding it here. When you've got your what we call the implicit solution. There are some that you'll come across that cannot be solved explicitly for y. It'll be an implicit function, which you have seen before in calculus. Um, so you'll know when they pop up, but just know that you can have an implicit solution that's obviously not ideal, but there's going to be some that are literally impossible to solve for y. But when you get here, oftentimes this is the best place to find what c needs to be for your initial value problem. And then you can continue solving for y having concrete numbers and not needing to carry forward another constant. So we go ahead and solve this. So, you know, flip and flip. This is 1 over 28 minus 3x squared. Okay, now we've got the solution, but we got to think about where does this thing live? Um, because this does have discontinuities. Where does it have discontinuities? Well, when the bottom is equal to zero. So, you know, uh, 28 equals 3x squared. So this, this comes into being a problem at x equals plus or minus the square root of 28 over 3. This encompasses the whole thing. So, really, what do we have? We have a problem when it's equal to those points. So, you know, we have some intervals of validity here. The first is, I don't know, we'll call it I1, negative infinity up to the negative square, I'm writing this poorly, the negative square root of 28 over 3. Second interval would be between those two points. There's the negative. And then the third would be above it. A solution just needs to be continuous on one interval to be valid. So all three of these are valid in terms of um, this general solution, but in for the initial condition that we have, we need what we need y of 1 to be 1 25th. So we need to be in the interval where 1 lives and so that would be this interval here. So this is the interval of validity. But to note, these are valid given different conditions. OK? So those are the two last points I wanted to make that you have an interval of validity that you need to consider. It will be um, enforced by your initial condition and that sometimes leaving something in implicit solution form is okay. And again, that's only when you can't solve for y. You should really give it your best effort to do so. So that's separable equations. Um, make sure you, know, you bring uh, a lot of good questions to class and we will uh, tackle some problems together. See you there.